Well, good afternoon. Are there any um, are there any questions? What what is the main um, what is the main point in the course? That's the question, I guess. But um, of course, I guess you're supposed to answer. You're supposed to answer some questions yourself. <clears throat> um, Justin, are you are you Justin? Do you have um, an idea what the course is about by now? I hope. I mean, I hope. I hope everyone does, because because it's really about just one thing. I would say. Okay. Yeah. Right. And um, you know what the letter K stands for? We're supposed to stand. Historically, supposed to stand for. Yeah, well, I think it's class, the German uh, word for class. <clears throat> and if, so you have, so in other words, K class should be somehow uh, redundant. The, oh, the K class of an, of a, of an item potent, uh, finitely generated productive module. Larry? And uh, what uh, what would you would you say um, the course is about? Well, if it's if it's one if 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 it's if it's one um, if it's just one, if I'm saying it's just one thing, and somebody has already said just one thing, then I guess if you don't have much choice, do you? <laughs> oh well, okay. But you mentioned C star algebras too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, my point of view is the case theory arose out of C star algebra, so that's also kind of redundant because it's um, also really um, almost the only, only game in town. If you're doing C star algebra, and, um, uh, uh, as we've seen for at least for AF algebra, for UHF algebra, the Glynn's UHF algebra, infinite tensor product of matrix algebra, and then uh, as I've been uh, starting to talk about with. Uh, Bratley's um, um, AF algebra, the, the um, K, K, K theory, K, the K0 group, the K0 functor is all you need to, uh, to, to um, at least to, to, tell, to tell them apart. <clears throat> I went to a, a lecture this morning at the Fields uh, Metal Symposium uh, going on right now at the Fields Institute. It's, um, and it's about, um, uh, it's in honor of, of um, particular field medalists. Um, every, um, every year someone has chosen um, some recent field medalist is um, chosen. Since they're roughly four every four years, uh, that um, works out about even. <coughs> so the, so the, the, the person is, um, is invited to attend and um, the, the meeting. So. And tonight there's a public opening that um, it's taking place next door at the Fields Institute at, um, at, uh, at seven, uh, seven o'clock. It's just across the street, just across the patio, <clears throat> across the square. Um, so the, There'll be a there'll be some dignitaries um, talking about how important mathematics is, and then um, there'll be someone talking about how important the work of um, Cochet of uh, Berker is. <clears throat> I'm probably not pronouncing his name right. Surely not pronouncing his name right. <clears throat> um, and it's, it's, about, it's about the classification. One of his um, main uh, themes is the classification of algebraic variety. And I think what this means, as I already understood from the lecture I attended this morning, is that what it means is you attach parameters not just to the construction of the objects in your category, and you're, you're classifying, studying and classifying. Like the UHF algebras were, uh, there was a parameter, it's, uh, Almost it was a subset of the real line, right? It's a cantor set. 
uh, the parameter drives the construction of UHF algebras. But it turned out it also the same, exactly the same parameter, also uh, also uh, parameterized the um, isomorphism classes. The, the different supernatural numbers give you different um, different um, um, algebras. But but still, when we to, to prove this, we talked about categories and functors, right? To 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 to, um, to, uh, to recapture um, Pixmay's version of of Grimm's uh, proof. <clears throat> but the um, in, in 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 the rest of mathematics, it seems that um, that people uh, are able are able to to find uh, parameters um, for the isomorphism classes, um, and this is this is one of the um, main um, uh, achievements. Um, whereas as soon as we um, as soon as we pass to the free floating algebra of a, of a UHF algebra, then the um, the parameter somehow dissolves; it disappears into thin air. It's no longer a nice topological space. It's, there are no open sets whatsoever. If you look at the quotient space, the equivalence relation, and such. Well, it's pretty. That's a good exercise to check what the quotient topology is. If you look at the uh, first of all, what the equivalence relation is. How much can you change a supernatural number uh, in order that the associated um, uh, UHF algebra, when you look at its free-floating algebra, doesn't change? Okay. If we. <clears throat> So some of us anyway have discussed the question of what happens if you multiply by two. And the, I think we agreed that if you take two by two, which means taking two by two matrices over your uh, uh, algebra. Well, if, if the algebra is any free floating algebra, taking uh, finite matrices, fixed to finite order of matrices, is not gonna change the algebra. Simply because of N is a finite number, uh, one, two, three, so on. And, and you look at infinity, then n times infinity is equal to infinity. If you take the count of first countable infinity, then you get exactly the same one. And that means that if you, you multiply the number of rows and columns by um, two, you get, you get the same number of rows and columns. So the, uh, um, <clears throat> so the, um, so that's an example of how you can change the supernatural number. Well, it's a good exercise to, to find out exactly what the general um, equivalence relation is. And, and then if, if, the, if the supernatural numbers form a counter set, what is the quotient um, space? Every equivalence relation on a topological space, you can pass to the equivalence classes and the quotient topology. What's the quotient topology? How many people know what the quotient topology is? Charlie? Okay, good. Uh, uh, remind me of your name. Are you Abu? Are you Abu? Sabak, Sabak. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So what uh, do, uh, do you want to um, remind people what the um, quotient topology is? Do you have a, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, that, that sounds exactly right, yeah. And uh, a surjective map from one space to the other, I guess that's um, from one set to another, that's almost uh, talking about an equivalence relation, right? That, that's, uh, uh, that could be another definition of an equivalence relation, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, I think it's a good question. First of all, to, to, to determine what the um, equivalence relation is on the, uh, the counter set of, um, of supernatural numbers, and then what the quotient space is, if it's, um, and in particular, okay, so I, I, I've forgotten what it is, but I, I, I know it's pretty bad, so I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess, I'm sort of casting back with my uh, pretty uh, faulty memory, um, uh, that you get don't get any open sets at all, okay, except for uh, the um, empty set and the whole and the whole set. Okay, but uh, I I I am um, happy to be corrected on that. But certainly it won't be house door, for instance. It won't for sure. It won't be uh, uh, what is generally thought of as a nice, uh, uh, well well behaved 
respectable topological state, which, which, which would be, uh, which you would want to uh, have for, we're going to call something in the space of moduli, a, param a parameter for the isomorphism class. So, <clears throat> for, a, for general AF algebras, even if they're um, simple and uh, unital, just like UHF algebra, uh, the um, situation also is complicated. Um, the only way to classify them, and it's a new, uh, it's this new version of classifiability, where you have, a, you have, a, a, I'm just going to ignore, let me, someone tell me if they give them a headache, okay, if I, if I do just ignore what's already on the board. Okay, but, um, so um, you have a, a, a big category which you want to classify, and then you want to uh, classify it with a small, a smaller category, meaning it's simpler, it's fewer arrows, okay? And um, <clears throat> you want to, and then what's the classification function? Well, yeah, any function maps arrows into arrows, right? And we want um, that all the objects on the right should be at least isomorphic to objects that arise on the left. And also, okay, well, look, it, by the way, if you have a functor and you have an isomorphism um, upstairs, then for sure it's going to give you an isomorphism downstairs for sure. Okay. But uh, if, uh, if, if uh, the identity maps go to identity maps, that's what a functor does. And um, and then um, if, if forwards and backwards is the identity map, then that will happen in the um, in the image too. Okay. But what we want to know is that if the if the um, images of two objects are um, are isomorphic, then is there an isomorphism? Is there an isomorphism upstairs? Okay, and that and if there is, that's called a classification function because the isomorphism classes are distinguished by the function. But the um, these objects, uh, may, you can't be comp you can't compare them. They're just the well, best you can do is say they're isomorphic, because there'll be groups in general. And every C three algebra has a different. The K group is abstract. The K zero group is an abstract abelian group. Uh, well, it's it's concrete starting from the uh, algebra. You look at the idempotent, then you look at the equivalence classes, and that's abstract. That now is abstract. So, <clears throat> and you so it's apples and oranges. You can't say they're equal. But, but if you have a bag with 12 apples and 12 oranges, you can say they, they have a bijective correspondence. It's isomorphic in a sense. You ignore the fact that the apple, an apple isn't exactly an orange. Okay, well, if you have two uh, groups, it makes sense to say they're isomorphic. And that's, and if it's a unital AF algebra, then um, it makes sense to say they're isomorphic in a way that um, preserves the class of the unit. And that will be true if the algebras are isomorphic. Because if they're isomorphic, of course, the unit will coincide. So the units will correspond by the isomorphism, right? If they're unital, they have algebra. Let's consider the case of unital, they have algebra. And by the way, uh, we, we can't rely on the traces anymore for to compute K0. In the um, case of the UHF algebra, you wanted to compute the get a concrete computation of the trace of, of the K zero group as a as a together with the unit the special element as a set of numbers. You just look at the um, normalized trace on the trace on the algebra, the unique trace which is normalized on the unit, and you look at the traces of projection, and that will give you numbers in the interval zero one, and and the, and that's the intersection with the interval zero one of the K zero group, uh, up to isomorphism. Okay, so. That's um, but that's so special uh, for general unital AF algebra. Even if it has a unique trace, even if there is a unique, there's always a trace. If it's say simple, no, no closed two-sided ideals, no non-trivial closed two-sided ideals. If it's um, simple and has unique trace, what's unique trace? What's unique uh, trace? You, normalized, of course, on the unit. Well, the the uh, k zero functor is uh, as is still with a special element, the class of the uh, unit, 
that's uh, complete invariant, okay? That's what the, um, that's what my version of uh, Bratley's uh, isomorphism theorem says. And um, by the way, I hope people are having fun proving that the category, but putting, interpreting Bratley diagrams as a category and showing that it's equivalent to the category of, um, of uh, order groups um, that arise as a K group from AF algebra. <clears throat> it's a special element. Okay. But, um, so the unique trace is a, this is a red herring. You can't, uh, it tells you nothing about K0, okay? It tells you something about K0, but it doesn't nail it down because it gives you a functional on K0, but this may not be uh, injective, okay? May not be enough, maps the K0 into the real numbers, but the K0 may not be um, uh, order isomorphic. It gives you an order uh, positive, preser positivity preserving mapping from the, um, from the, from the um, K0 group into the real numbers, which any trace does. But it, uh, and, and, and for, U, for UHF algebra, it just happens that um, this is an isomorphism, a group, uh, an order isomorphism, in fact. But in general, not a chance. Well, okay. But um, that means that you have to look at the, um, K0 group. Well, when I did it, I just talked about very fundamental equivalence. And then when uh, Larry Brown uh, started to point out how important it was to interpret that as, um, as K0, I, I, I said, well, that's fine. Although I didn't take his hint. His hint was there's also K1. Okay. I was trying to lift projections. I was talking about this earlier. I was trying to lift projections from the quotient. And you realize that, K, that lifting projections is a bit, uh, it's the first step would be to lift K0 classes from the quotient, okay? You have a, a, a K0 maps the algebra onto the quotient, maps K0 of the algebra, K0 functor, uh, the, the, the quotient map going from the algebra to the quotient, takes the K0 group of the algebra onto the K0 group of the quotient. And if you know that's surjective, um, then that says that every K class lifts, okay? But that's, that's almost the same as saying every projection lifts, which is exactly what I wanted. And, and um, Larry was, when he said, well, so is also uh, K1, when I said, so, uh, uh, so, so, uh, uh, so, so what to, to his, his suggestion that I was working with K0. Uh, well, he, what he was expecting me to pick up on was that K1 of the ideal, in this six term is that well known six term exact sequence. K1 of the ideal is zero, and which by exactness says that uh, the K0 map into the K0 of the quotient is surjective because uh, the image is the kernel of the next map, which is zero, because the, because the uh, map into the zero group. So, um, <clears throat> so that uh, I sort of missed out on that one. And, uh, Larry Brown finally had to sit down and write write the paper. So, okay, but uh, <clears throat> that would be that would be a sort of a, um, a, a piece of history that would be a, a good subject for an essay, I think. <clears throat> um, well, okay, but the uh, and the, the so you look at the K zero. Uh, functor and you get two for two K zero algebras at first it's the unit ones but um, um but that, in other words it's not going to help with the unit the, the um it, it's the K zero is still just an abstract group and then you have unique trace and uh, you have two different AF algebras simple with units even unique trace you look at the K zero group with the special elements they're going to be um apples and oranges, you can't say they're equal. You can say they're isomorphic and then that's what I was talking about last time. Well, recently I've been talking about the um, intertwining argument, uh, which was, well, it was first, um, it was used by Bradley already in his intertwining of Bradley diagrams to prove isomorphism. The Bradley diagrams were equivalent, which in his sense meant there was an intertwining in the natural sense. And this could be, um, Trace back to a, 
um, isomorphism between the algorithms. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> um, how, how do we... Um, <coughs> Um, well, one thing I wanted to do was was look a bit more at the um, at the triple squiggle um, proof. Okay, the first proof was you intertwine the K zero groups. The first step, second step is for each um, K zero map between uh, finite stages in the two sequences. For each K zero map, you find an algebra map that uh, gives rise to it. But then these are uh, just a constructed piecemeal. <clears throat> so the, the second diagram is not going to commute. It would be, <clears throat> it would be the, um, you, you could, um, um, <clears throat> if it happened to commute if some, when you did it one day, then you, then you could make a note that that was a good day. <laughs> okay. Because <clears throat> it probably, it probably, it probably going to be the last time it happened. All right, but then um, <clears> the <throat> third picture is when you take the algebra maps and you um, make them, uh, you modify each of them in such a way that it doesn't, it still lifts the K0 map, but change them by an inner automorphism. And um, because the unitary acting on projection takes one, takes, takes one projection into an equivalent projection, right? So it acts as the identity on K0. <clears throat> and um, okay, well, that's what I wanted to do. The, I, I did, I started to say how you did it, but um, I got bogged down a bit because the, um, you have to, you're going to have to look, you have to look at the actual definition of inductive limit, okay? So, um, We, as I said before, these circuit diagrams, I could almost use them, right? You know, um, I had an uncle who was a physicist. Well, he, I have an uncle historically. He died a few years ago. Uh, he came to Canada to be working for, as a postdoc uh, for the um, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited. I lived in the town where people lived, worked there. And um, so he was, uh, it was quite an experience to meet people like that. Um, and and um, one time, not that long ago, when I was moving back from Denmark, I, I had um, uh, uh, an electrical engineer in Denmark had um, modified my um, amplifier my Heathkit amplifier so it worked in Denmark. But um, after coming back, it didn't work here. And I had no idea how to, uh, how to work on, how to, how to work it out, what to do. And I had, I thought I had lost the manual, construction, a very detailed manual. So I asked my uncle if he would be, um, uh, if he would take, if he would mind taking a look at it. He was very happy to do it. And, uh, to look at it, and he just fixed it, okay? Uh, cold turkey. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the, um, I did, and quite a few years later, I found the manual. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it was, uh, no, I didn't mention it, I didn't mention it. And, and it was no longer necessary. In any case, I'm not sure that I could even have fixed it using the manual, okay? <laughs> okay, so um, we have the two sequences. Um, well, I, let's show several um, dots, meaning it's a direct sum of the finite stages are direct sums of, of Various numbers of full matrix algebra. Okay. And th these three dots, I can never resist making this making this funny, this silly comment. These three dots should not be confused with these dots. 
<laughs> and then we have the Vaughan Jones's black hole for Luna. <clears throat> And that's number one, and then we have number two, which of course is completely different, um, a completely different Bradley diagram. The finite stage maps are um, determined up to unitary equivalence. So that's the uniqueness theorem that we need to, to show that, that, um, that once we have the K0, uh, once we have the, um, the K0 intertwining, and then we've lifted the K0 maps individually to um, Algebra homomorphism, but with, with, with having non commutative um, triangles, we can modify the um, uniqueness theorem says you can modify the down up so that it's equal to the across after you put in an inner automorphism. But then the point is that the, um, you don't, that doesn't change the first map, the down map, and only you can think of it by associativity as just changing the up map, okay? And so you've changed the up map, and the first triangle is commutative. And then um, uh, you look at the second triangle, and you have up with the new up map, and then down, but it's, it's it acts the same as the same way on K0. Then you have down with the original choice of, um, of um, algebra map. And, and so you have the up down is gives you the same K0 as going across. So that's now, that was uh, commutative. And that's what I want to investigate now. Why is the K0 lifting commutative? Why can you choose it commutative? Um, but once you have uniqueness, up down is the same as across, and you can modify the second down map by, um, by you know, you know, you know, automorphism. And when you're finished, you have a completely stupid commutative algebra diagram, okay? And so it's a, it's a, it, it's, I, I wouldn't even, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it's not even respectable to assign it as an exercise. If you have a commutative intertwining diagram like this in any category, then it gives you um, an isomorphism in the limit. Okay. But, um, maybe don't try to do it in the, it's just like uh, you, get the, you get a warning sometimes, don't, um, don't try this at home. Well, don't, don't, maybe don't try it for an arbitrary category at first. Just look at uh, at um, finite dimensional um, finite direct sums of finite dimensional matrix algebra, showing that the um, commutative diagram involving two horizontal sequences gives you an isomorphism between the limits. Converges, converges, if you like, in a natural sense, algebraic sense. It's true for the c algebra limits too, but we're just looking at the algebra limits. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I draw this black hole sort of a mirror image to draw it a little differently. I guess you can't really tell what one one of those uh, shadings is, is clockwise and one is counterclockwise. <clears throat> But that's sort of in a, a memorial gesture to uh, Vaughan, the late Vaughan Jones, um, who um, distinguished the knot on your left shoe from the knot on your right shoe. Okay, that's worth some. Um, that's worth uh, looking into. I mean, at least in general terms, it's um, what is the Jones knot polynomial? Well, you don't need to do it with phenomenal algebra. You can do it with matrix algebra. Find it with matrix algebra. It's beyond Wikipedia. Once you know it exists, some, it's a challenge sometimes just to rediscover something. Okay. It's, in the, it's in the air now. But it's um, <clears throat> this is controversial, perhaps it's open to debate, but uh, some people might say it was the most important discovery. Um, let's say mathematical discovery in the last century. <clears throat> and that you don't need fundamental algebra, you don't need operator algebra, even matrix algebra to, um, to um, um, understand it because um, uh, Edward Witten 
Have I, have I mentioned the, that, that story? Yeah, okay, but uh, it's, too, it's too good a story to, um, to um, not mention it again. So I have a knot. A knot can be thought of as an embedding of S1 into S3, okay? S1 being the circle and S3 being a three dimensional space. It's the, um, I think if you take three dimensional space, and put a point at infinity, I think you get S, um, S3, okay? All right. So what, um, what, what Witten said you should do is take, a, a, take your favorite quantum field and just integrate it along the circle, okay? And that's the Jones polynomial. Roughly speaking. Okay, so what um, um, we were, we assume that, um, that you have a isomorphism between the, um, this is the K groups now, well, isomorphism between the algebra, but then this is an isomorphism. It gives you an isomorphism by punctuality, gives you um, isomorphism between the K0 group. Let's say taking um, the unit to the unit. Let's look at the unit OK. Of course, if they're inverses, what, the, the inverse is going to take the one into the one going backwards. <clears throat> Okay, um, so what we want is to get the first uh, step, the first squiggly step, and we would like, notice um, that uh, it's sort of, it's, it's, um, it's sort of um, assumed right off the bat that this first diagram is commutative, okay? And that means it is, uh, it shouldn't be too hard. The idea is it's not too hard to get it commutative. So you, the first step is to take some, some uh, element here where you have generators, right? It's a free group with three, with, with three free abelian group with three generators, right? As a, as a group goes. So you um, maybe assume it's just, you take the case where it's just singly generated. Then this, you look at where this, where this goes to in the limit, okay? But then it comes to something down here. And so, and then that something down here will certainly come from something at the finite stage. This is just the algebraic inductive limit. Okay? So what's the algebraic inductive limit of a bunch of uh, Bielian groups? Well, um, it's not as it, it's not injective maps. It's slightly this is slightly subtle. Okay, if it were not injective maps, if it were if it were injective maps, just increasing uh, sets, then if you have a something in the union, obviously it has to belong to one of the finite sets. But in the inductive limit with non-injective maps, and, and you can, sometimes you can never uh, construct the decomposition. If you have your ordered group, sometimes you can never construct the decomposition that has injective maps, okay? And finite direct sums of copies of Z at every stage, even if, it, uh, even if you can, can get it without injective maps. That was, that was something that held me up for a while, for quite a, for about a year, I think, in my, uh, uh, when I was trying to prove this, um, this theorem. And my first preprint uh, somehow said, well, we can assume the maps are injected. And a student of Dixmay's, um, um, Odile Maréchal, pointed out to me in the letter that, uh, that that was not a justified, that was not justified. And so, and, then, and, and well, she certainly knew of, of a counterexample. Uh, she didn't mention it, but um, I, I found a report. When I finally wrote the paper, where, where I realized you didn't need injective maps, I put a counterexample in to show you you, you didn't you need you needed a proof that didn't assume injective maps. Okay, these are just maps at the level of groups, which could take positive elements into positive elements. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, this first positive generator, number one, the number one in the group said, 
are mapped into something here, and there's something down here. And, and so at some finite stage, if you look at the definition of, of, of the inductive limit of the non-injective map, even for sets, uh, everything does come from, if it's just sets without uh, the about metric or topology or anything, it's just purely algebraic inductive limit, and everything does come from the finite stage, okay? You have to, it's a, it's a um, every, every time you have a different category, you have, it's a good question whether it, in that category you have inductive limits or sequences. Uh, and um, um, that's defined in terms of a universal property, okay? The universal property that says that, um, here's, this would be the inductive limit. If whenever you have uh, finite stage maps, into some other test object, and the previous diagram from the, the maps between the finite stage objects down to the, well, which arrows from the finite stage objects down to some other object, which um, give you commutative triangles all the time, then that should factor through the, um, the um, candidate for the, uh, for the limit, right? The, 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 universal, the universal property says that there's a unique, um, Factorization, okay, and so you have, to, and that's this is any category, okay. Now I, I use the term inductive limit or other terms, so. <clears throat> and and, um, and that's regardless of whether these maps are injective or not. Well, but it doesn't always exist, okay. So you have to, when it does exist, you have to uh, construct it. And for abelian groups or for sets, the same thing, um, same same construction. You just um, you just look at sequences of elements. Okay, so these are elements now, not the uh, objects. So, okay, you look at the sequence of elements. Of course, the that means a contiguous a contiguous element. First goes into the second, second goes into the third, and so on. Infinite connected sequence of elements. Um, but it doesn't, of course, if it always started at the beginning, then, then it would be, you could only have so many, you would only have as many um, elements as there were elements, you would only have as many connected sequences as there were elements of starting at the beginning, okay? But in fact, you can start anywhere. You can start anywhere. There's an element up here which doesn't come from here. So these maps, of course, are not surjective uh, any more than they're injective. And um, if you just look at the connected sequences, and then it's not a concrete construction, you look at equivalence classes, okay? Two, two connected sequences are equivalent. If what? Well, there, there's a, there's a um, good homework question, okay? If, if it doesn't pop out of my head right away, that it's, uh, then by definition, huh, it's an exercise, okay? If, if, you wanted to, if you wanted to see me work, then I, then I might, uh, someone, well, I wouldn't welcome if six people put up hands and said, we require you to, uh, to uh, uh, describe this construction. Well, uh, I wouldn't know what to do. I, I have to go, I have to, uh, but um, do, do people agree? Do, do people agree to uh, take this as a possible homework exercise or at least to think about? Um, okay, good. Because, um, I, you know, I've done it before. I, I'm, I, I can assure you, I've done it before, and and anything I've done before, I can almost uh, hope to do again. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Um, <clears throat> so that's um. So the question is, what what? How do you identify two contiguous uh, sequences? But the point is that everything in the limit does come from some uh, contiguous uh, sequence, and. Um, so that's so you just look at the, this element when it went, what it went into down here, and you pull it back to where the contiguous sequence, some place where it was on the maybe where the contiguous sequence began, not necessarily that, just some place on the contiguous sequence, okay? some element on the path, the contiguous path. Okay. So, um, but then you just uh, map um, this element directly down to there. And then by the free, since it's a free group, the whole group maps, okay? It's a group map. And that's, uh, 
and then you just proceed likewise. Suppose these are all just single z, okay? It's the same idea in general. Okay, so then you get a map, except that this is not, it's not position number two, it's some finite position, okay? And then going up, you get again some finite position, some finite stage, this, this maps up. And the question is, is this uh, first triangle commutative? Well, the answer is no. You have to fix it up so it's commutative. Okay. And that means uh, probably uh, when you define the first map, uh, allowing it to, to uh, meet up with the second uh, contiguous sequence farther out, okay? Allowing, so the first map maybe should be like this, and the next map going up should maybe be like this. I mean, going, meeting the, uh, the, meeting the up, upstairs sequence um, much farther out. <clears throat> Where you map this one out to the one that's here, the generator here, or each generator, each three generator, you map it out to infinity and up, and you pull that back to some finite stage. But we're now going to have to decide which finite stage, okay? And it definitely won't be the first, won't be the earliest possible one. So, now th this at this stage, I think it makes sense to think of it as homework. But why don't I try to just to show that I'm uh, at least half awake? Let me try to um, see if I see what I can do in a minute and a half. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, of um, modifying these arrows to go farther to, to go farther out, so in fact we get a commutative triangle. Okay. All right. So um, schematically we have this. Okay. This is the long, this is the arrows between the group. These are the arrows between the group, okay? Uh, at infinity, up and down at infinity. And we have these finite stage maps. And, um, and what do we know? How did we, what do we know about this diagram? Um, well, we know that if, if we um, look at, look, if we look at the, um, this, this map, we go up and across, that's the same as going across and up, okay? Right? That was how it, this map going up was chosen to be the same as, um, as uh, to be such that going up and across is the same as going across and up. All right? But then we just uh, erase this for the time being. And, and, um, and this, this combined map is the same as going down and across and up, okay? All right. But now this one down and across, down and across was the same as across and down, right? So, uh, so across and down and up was the, is the same as across and down and up. But down and up is the identity, okay? It's the same as across. So this combined map going down, up, and across is exactly the same as going across to infinity. You only to go to infinity, okay? So in other words, this triangle is commutative. If you compose it with this very, very long arrow going from this uh, uh, very, uh, apex of the triangle, if you like, to infinity, that's community. Well, um, so we have these two maps, down, up, and across, and they coincide after you go to infinity. Well, that's, that's true for, that means uh, we have finitely many, we have the generator here for generators, and then those, those these two maps take those generators to here. And saying the two maps are equal uh, is the same as saying they're equal on these generators. But um, they're not equal. They're not equal as it is. But if you go farther out, then they are. But uh, but that means that for any finite element, for any single element here. If you go to if if, if um, two maps if, if two well the image by the image by the two elements if a single element here it's imaged by the two maps down across and up and down down and up it would be two two maps two elements here and if they're the same at infinity 
That means they're the same at some finite stage uh, later, okay? That means there is some finite stage later where um, if you go down and up and across and just go to that finite stage, you, you get uh, the same, okay? But that means we can keep the first map now, we can keep the down map, we just change the up map uh, like this, and, and then they're commutative. That's how, you get a, that's how you get the first triangle community at the level of K0. And uh, just a, I'm, I'm claiming it's an elementary exercise and in, um, in the inductive limits, definition of inductive limits, using the fact that these groups are free abelian. Okay. Oh, now, um, yeah. If it's many generators, you have to decide whether it's uh, going to be, um, well, you want the maps to be positive too. I think that if we stick with some, I, I think that's a thrill to check, check, check later that you can make the maps all the maps preserve positivity, okay? Preserve the order relation. The main thing is to get them in the first place. Well, okay, that wasn't, that was, that was uh, more than a minute and a half. <clears throat> Okay, so that, that's, but that's more or less some, well, there's the uniqueness theorem, but for maps between the matrix algebra, if it's finite direct sums of matrix algebra, it's, it's six, it's, um, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. So the important thing is just to check um, two, two maps between um, MN and MN prime. Okay. And they're the same on K0. Um, and now they're not necessarily, um, they're not necessarily um, um, unital maps, okay? Because if you have, if you have a finite direct sum of matrix algebra and you map it to a finite direct sum of matrix algebra, you can think of that as a whole lot of maps between individual pairs of, um, of full matrix algebra, but these won't be unital. The units on the whole thing will go into the units on the whole thing. In particular, the, it, will, it will be the direct sum of, uh, of a whole lot of things um, at each stage. And, and but then the individual finite, the individual stage, at the, at the individual direct summons of the uh, domains stage will be, um, um, the units will be, the sum of a whole lot of things, orthogonal things. And so inside each um, full matrix algebra at the, um, at the second stage, the um, image of each of the individual units will be just some, some projection, some item book. Is that, uh, is it clear? Okay, so we just look at homomorphism. Star homomorphism, if you like. See star algebra. And um, so not, uh, not uniform. And the point is that um, that, that uh, if they're the same on K zero, then then what? Abigail, what's the, the two maps which are the same on K zero? Where K zero is Z, so that means they're multiplying the the the, 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 um, the, the Z map is uh, multiplying by some number, right? So that, they call that the multiplicity of the um, of the map of the embedding. And um, so if two maps have the same multiplicity, what can you say? In particular, if they're unital, if they're two unital maps, they would have the same multiplicity, okay? Because that would be just, uh, if, they, uh, if, if this, is, um, this is one by one, and this is n prime by n prime, then the one would go into n prime, right? That's the, uh, be model and the map on the level is that we're modifying by n prime. And um, if, if it's a unital map between two matrix algebra, what can you say about it? If, it, if it's two unital maps? Well, first of all, well, okay, in this case, we have n, the general n. I mean, if it's just, if it's, well, actually, in fact, we know, should, Professor Helmos said you should always look at a, a, a trivial special case first. Okay, well, he just said easier. Every, for every uh, problem is an easier one. He didn't mean necessarily trivial, but 
maybe it doesn't hurt. You can sort of uh, warm up slowly. So I guess the case of M1 into M2. And look at unit, unit maps, okay? Then how many of those are there? Well, actually, I guess there's only, uh, Abigail, you put up one finger. That was, the, that was your answer. That wasn't just putting up your hand, right? Okay, yeah, right, good. There's only one actual map. But, but suppose it's um, two by two going into, uh, well, three by three, there won't be any, okay? But four by four, there will be, but how many? Well, if you have one, if you have one map from M2 into M4, and of course you do, because you can write M4 as, as two by, we were discussing what happens when you take two by two matrices over something. You know, notice that M4 is the same as M2 uh, over M2. And two by two matrices over M2. Well, okay, so if the um, M2 maps into M4 by putting blocks down the diagonal, identical blocks down the diagonal. There's an example of a map from M2 into M4, unit on map. And of course, it's more close to two. It's say you're taking uh, the K0, the, the um, minimal, minimal projection here. Uh, what, one dimensional projection here will go into a two dimensional projection here. So it's multiplying by two. Um, and so here, one goes to, uh, to two, two times one. So, so okay, but uh, that's, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to, I don't have time to say what the answer is, okay? That's homework. Uh, if, if, if I have another, another map, from M2 into M4 that um, takes the unit into the unit, then uh, is it equal, must it be equal to the first one? Or uh, well, obviously not, okay? Or I wouldn't be asking the question. Well, you, uh, you have to be careful. Okay, but anyway, that's, uh, let's leave it at that. <clears throat> any, any, um, any questions? I hope everyone is um, is uh, is um, trying to get into the tutorial room on Friday, at two o'clock, three o'clock. In a pinch, I think that whole twenty people. It used to be undergraduates were uh, competitive. How many could get into a Volkswagen or a telephone booth? But now there are no more Volkswagen Beetles and no more no more telephone booths. So, the challenge to find a challenge. Okay. I'm sorry to be a bit silly. <laughs>